This is the Weather Lounge here at Weatherworks. Well, hello there, friends, and welcome back to the Weather Lounge. I'm your host, meteorologist Brad Miller, and our podcast comes to you from our Weatherworks headquarters located here in Hackettstown, New Jersey. And joining me for this week's episode is my fellow climate enthusiast, meteorologist Mike Mahalik. Hey there, Mike. Hey, Brad. How's it going? Climate enthusiast, huh? Yeah, well, I'm kind of getting into that, you know, uh, introduction with a hint of what's to come. So, and I thought, yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, I thought our audience would like some foreshadowing again on the topic. So, uh, you know, I thought uh, that that's kind of a hint, right? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it's a good idea. Um, you know, I've really been into climate um, just because I took a very interesting class back when I was in school at Penn State University. Um, but I've also read a few books that, you know, they, they talk about climate change. They talk about the ice sheets, meltdown, sea level rises and falls. Um, it doesn't make me an expert uh, by any means. <laughs> I don't think there's any sure. experts out there right now with the, this whole thing. <laughs> well, we do have one, though, however, that I think is going to be a really good guest. And since neither you or I um, have the skill set here to talk about climate at length, since we're operational forecasters and we're worried about, you know, the next week or so, um, you know, I thought it'd be good if we invite a guest that maybe really knows his stuff on this topic. Yeah, and I'll tell you, this is uh, we're very fortunate to have our guest today. His name is uh, Dr. Richard Alley. He's the Evan Pugh University Professor of Geosciences at Penn State University. He studied climate since 1987. He's made four trips to Antarctica and nine to Greenland. And he's been studying the ice cores and the great ice sheets. He's participated in the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and was a co-recipient of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. He's provided advice on climate to a U.S. vice president, multiple presidential science advisors, committees, and members of Congress. And he's had a multitude of published scientific papers and has presented on a TV miniseries on climate and authored The Two Mile Time Machine. Please welcome Dr. Richard Alley. Boy, oh boy, you have been busy the last 30 to 40 years, Dr. Alley. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to see you, Brad and Mike, and and great to to connect with your audience. (laughs) Yeah, and uh, so glad to have you on for sure uh, to talk about climate and climate change for that matter. you know, I got to tell a story for my listeners. Uh, I had your class uh, back in 2002 at Penn State University when I was there, and uh, it had quite an impact on me as far as uh, abrupt climate change. And uh, I mean, it's surprising all these years, and I still remember your class, Dr. Alley. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, Mike. It, it is a pleasure indeed. So yes, um, <clears throat> we climate scientists are never going to put you out of a job. The weather is going to always be <laughs> here. But there were times that climate almost got fast enough for you to worry about it. So yes. <laughs> As we were talking be- before the show, Dr. Alley does not remember Mike, though, by the way, uh, just, just for the, <laughs> oh, just for the record. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, man. Man, that's that's I'm rough, sorry, I'm Brad. Sorry. Why don't you do that, Brad? Come I'm on, sorry. Mike's a yeah. good guy. Come on. I know. Yeah, man, you're really uh, really ruining the uh, thing here. But hey, um, but let's get right on to climate change a little bit here. Um, you know, Dr. Alley. I mean, I don't. We gave all your credentials there. I don't know if there's anything we missed in that description there. But maybe a good question to start out with: What got you into things concerned about climate and climate change. <laughs> I backed into it, right? So I, I desperately wanted to be a geologist. And um, I went to Ohio State because it was down the road and I could afford it. And I desperately needed a summer job to pay for it. And there was a job helping the glaciologist, whatever that meant. And that was in the summer of 1977. And so I got into helping the glaciologist and that's ice. And then it's ice collapsing and flooding the coasts. And it's records of climate change written in the layers of ice cores. And if you're reading the history, now you're a climate scientist. So I just backed into this and 
Um, my dear wife agreed that she'd put up with me being a glaciologist. And, you know, I spent our first anniversary in the field. I spent our fifth anniversary in the field. I was in the field for nine and 10 and 12. <laughs> God bless her. You're still married to her? <laughs> We're still married. Thanks. Hey. Good for you. Thank you, Cindy. Congratulations. <laughs> That's that woman. Uh, so, I mean, based on all your research, I mean, we we know that climate has always changed, um, uh, which proves that climate can be changeable. But in your research, how do we know that you know climate changes every now and then? Yeah. So it's it, this is long, you know, and you know this, Mike, because we spent a semester going over it. Um, history is useful. History is very useful. And and you know this, even, you know, the for your weather forecasts, you have to spin them up with a little bit of history. You're assimilating data to, to make sure that they're running right when they go through the present and into the future. Um, you can check your understanding against history. You can, can frame against history. We know the climate is changing now. In fact, you know that, that the Weather Service has changed their norms, what you compare to in your careers. Um, I live in a different plant hardiness zone than when I moved to central Pennsylvania because it's warmed and I can now grow things here that I was not supposed to grow when I moved here. So, so we do know that things change. In our job is to find records of past climate and back a little ways you can use writings of early observers and people who didn't realize they were observers but they were and before that it's written in the muds the uh, ice the tree rings the all the things that respond to climate and we have to figure out how to read them, what they tell us, and we have to figure out how old they are because history is what happened and when. And so there's this whole field of figuring out what happened and figuring out why it happened. So making records of possible causes of climate change and making records of climate change, and then seeing if that supports our understanding, see if we can use that to start things further in the past and run them through the present. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, you, you mentioned that you went to uh, Greenland, you, you, you did ice cores through the ice sheets. So what is that telling you? I mean, from your class, I remember it was something almost like a tree ring uh, kind of thing, but with ice um, from what I remember. And hopefully I'm remember, remembering that correctly. Um <laughs> But uh, but how does that work? I mean, how are how are there layers that you can examine? Yeah, so so if you go to Central Greenland, it it snows, um, you know the this much ice and sort of you know, that much snow in a, in a year, and summer is different than winter. The sun shines in the summer and it doesn't it doesn't shine in the winter. You're north of the Arctic Circle. The sunshine changes the structure of the snow. And so you can actually go up there and dig a hole in the snow and you can look at it. And summers and winters look different. And then we can check ourselves, go back for a few years and see if it's working and dig up the old snowmobile tracks, you know. Um, we can check, is it working? Back in 1954, we blew up the Kini Atoll with a really, really dirty atomic bomb. And the fallout from that is around the world in 1955. So you can check, count down to 1955 and see if you get it. We can count down to the um, well dated historical volcanoes. Um, 1783, Ben Franklin is in Paris representing the young United States, and this dry fog blows in. And Ben Franklin says, oh, there must be a volcano erupting in Iceland. Well, the people in Iceland knew this. Their sheep were dying from the fluorine from Loch Aguirre. Um, we have the fallout of Lockie in 1783 in Greenland. We can see if we hit it right. So we can check the dating as far back as we have dating, and it works beautifully. 
And the thickness of an annual layer is how much it snowed with a little correction for the ice flow. Um, if you know how much snow fell, when you see more dirt or dust or sea salt or pollen or pollution or anything like that, you can tell how those are changing in the air. There's all kinds of indicators of the temperature in Greenland at that time. It's not a global temperature, but it is the temperature in Greenland. And there are bubbles that have old air in them. And that old air is a sample of what's going on. There are records of cosmic ray produced isotopes in there. So you can assess any effect of cosmic rays changing. There isn't any, um, nothing that we can see. And so you have all of these things. What could cause the climate to change? Um, how did the climate change? How did the atmosphere change? And they're all in the core together. I was going to say, you know, you were talking about how you, you go back and you look at old stuff to kind of get an idea what's going to happen in the future with climate change. You know, we do the same thing, as you said, in forecasting, but we don't go back as that far. Uh, you know, we use analogs and things like that. Like, all right, well, here's the setup with this cold front and the severe threat for the Northeast here over the next two days. And let's check the analogs and see how it can compare to a, you know, uh, a similar setup and maybe we'll get the kind of results that we're, you know, and we use that for forecasting the same way, but again, on a much shorter term versus, uh, you know, something that may happen, you know, in the next hundred years. Yes, absolutely. And you use, you know, so you're actually, you assimilate data from very short times, no more than two weeks. And then you do the analog search going back. Some of what's going on with our climate now is linked to things that come in from, further back in time than two weeks. So, right. And so we worry, of course, we worry about ENSOs, but El Nino's and sloshing in the Pacific. But we also worry about, uh, there's a longer memory in the ocean. There's a longer memory in the ice. And then we do go back and look for analogs. We are moving towards a warmer world than has ever been observed by instruments. Um, we've, we've never been as warm as we're headed to with an instrumental observation. And so we can go back and start asking what were warm climates like? It was uh, a lot warmer than now, you know, like 40 million years ago. What, what was it like? What was causing it? What is it? So, so I guess, I guess the biggest concern though, going forward, at least in the rest of our lifetimes and, you know, even in the next 50 to hundred years, I guess it's the rate of change. Is that going to be the biggest issue, I guess, uh, I would imagine? I mean, granted, there's climate change happening, and I guess that's going to be the biggest issue, I, I would imagine, here in the next life, uh, in the next generation or two. Yeah, it's probably rate of change and where it's going. So, you know, the basics, the, um, the realization that the Earth's surface is warmer than it would be without greenhouse gases goes back to Fourier in 1824. And the realization that CO2 is really important in this story is Eunice Foote in, um, when was she? She was 1856 and then Tyndall in 1859. The first calculation that our fossil fuel burning would raise CO2 and warm the world is Arrhenius in 1896. Um, the modern quant that's before quantum mechanics, right? The modern quantum mechanical understanding of radiative transfer. You, you guys took radiative transfer and you got through it. And this is a huge <laughs> hassle because that is a hard course. Okay. Radiative transfer is really hard, but it's really well understood. And a lot of that understanding was done by the air force after world war II when they were worried about things like what sensor to put on a heat-seeking missile. And if you're looking for the infrared from the enemy bomber and you pick the band that CO2 absorbs, it doesn't work. And so they were doing radiative transfer for heat-seeking missiles, but it's the CO2 doesn't care if the infrared is from the enemy bomber or from the sun-warmed earth. It just absorbs it. So, you know, the basics of, yes, we're releasing CO2. This is warming the world. That just is. We could, if we do the wrong things, by the time our, probably when you're old, we can start making parts of the world um, 
too hot for humans to exist without protection. So we can start getting to the point that you're sitting outside in the shade, in the wind, naked, drinking water, and you're going to die of heat stroke. Um, so we don't want to get to that. We don't want to get to a lot of sea level rise, um, but we also don't want to do anything fast. We have built for the world we have, we have built, we, people live in hot places, they live in cold places, they live in wet places, they live in dry places, and they've built for them. They have settled where the floods are not supposed to flood them out. And we don't want to change it faster than the sort of turnover of houses and decisions and roads and stuff. And we're doing that now. Wow. So basically, um, so you're telling us that Obviously, CO two is a is a is a big driver of the warming that's happening um, right now. Uh, but some people like to equate warmings to other uh, things, like uh, some impacts from from asteroids or whatever it may be. But uh, what's your stance on that? Because you know, a lot of times everybody says, "Hey." an impact caused this meltdown or an impact caused that meltdown or this extinction or that extinction. So what's going on there actually? Can impacts really do this or is it just the CO2? So, so the, the meteorite killed the dinosaurs and it did it. It's, so we do sort of know the history of impacts. When the, the solar system formed, there were a lot of big rocks flying around out there. And almost all of the big ones have fallen into Jupiter or the sun, or they've already banged us. And so there's, there's some out there, but the likelihood of a big one is getting smaller. Um, the one that killed the dinosaurs was just a really unlucky shot. And it happened to hit a place that there was a lot of sulfur in the rocks, and there was a lot of carbon in the rocks. And usually you throw a rock at the earth and it's going to hit somewhere in the middle of an ocean and it's not going to do much. But if it hits rocks with, so what's it do? It blasts stuff out of the, the earth. It falls back. It gets really hot. It burns a bunch of stuff, right? You know, what's a shooting star? It gets hot because it's heating up, falling through the atmosphere. The stuff falling down got hot and it burns stuff. Then it leaves sulfur in the stratosphere. And this is like a, a eruption cloud from Pinatobo or something writ large. So it blocks the sun, it gets dark, plants can't grow, they freeze. Then that falls down in a few years. And now there's lots of extra CO2 in the air because there was carbon in the rocks. Now it gets really hot. So you're trying to live and first you get burned and then you get frozen and in the dark and then you get cooked. Uh, so that one did. We can't. That sounds like a great time. Oh, it's a great time. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. And it killed most what of a the time. things on the planet, you know. But that's 66 million years ago. We can't find any serious evidence of a meteorite affecting the climate since 66 million years ago. So there's, if you'll find, if you look in the wrong place, you'll find some, every event in earth history at some point has been blamed on a meteorite and then you do some more science that makes a prediction you check the predictions whoops it doesn't work it makes some more predictions you check the predictions whoops those don't work either and eventually the meteorite disappears from the scientific discussion it never disappears from the public discussion it's the the ones that gets out it's always out there bouncing around somewhere in the blogosphere but there's no evidence of a meteorite doing anything serious since the one that killed the dinosaurs. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that kind of, you know, throws a couple of theories that I've heard right out the window <laughs> because I've heard a lot of things about um, the end of the last ice age. And, you know, there's that period called the younger Dryas, and they're trying to say that there was an impact there and, and, or maybe it was a comet or something like that. And there's these little nano diamonds and spherules and all this kind of stuff. They're coming out now. Me, not knowing any type of geology in that aspect, because I'm a meteorologist, uh, <laughs> I'm listening to this going, wow, that sounds really like important evidence here. But, you know, obviously, you know, there's more going on than what that might have been telling me. 
much more. So, I mean, the, the glibest and easiest one is that it, it was put forward that there was this one, you're coming out of the ice age, it's warming up, it sort of staggers a little. And one of those events is named, it's called the Younger Dryas. And um, it, it, it was a reappearance of, a, of an Arctic flower called Dryas in places that were otherwise warmer. So there's a little cooling during the warming. Um, the suggestion was made that maybe this had something to do with a meteorite or a comet or something. The easy glibus thing is that there were dozens of these abrupt changes and um, they happened in previous ice ages as well. And there's no sign of anything on any of those others. So this can't really be what's important. Um, the, the suggested occurrence was, it was already dropping into the Younger Dryas before the putative meteorite hit. And it's fairly clear that there wasn't one. Um, people wanted it to be this crater in, in um, Greenland. There's this beautiful crater under the edge of the ice sheet in Greenland, but that's uh, more than 50 million years old. Um, it's just been dated. And so, no, that was not something 11,000 years ago or 12,000 years ago because it's 50 million years old. So. Wow. You know, Dr. Alley, I was just going to uh, bring up the uh, this age of uh, social media that we live in now with Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and, you know, and everything is out there, basically. You know, I don't care what topic it is, whether it's the medical industry or, you know, you have a, a sickness, or you go to Google it, you're, you know, and, and we have this frustration with forecasting and uh, with people seeing a snowstorm two weeks in advance and plopping it on Twitter and wow, you know, two feet for New York city on uh, January 18th. And, you know, by uh, two weeks later, it turns into rain or it's a miss. Um, do you, in, in your field, do you struggle with the same frustration that when you see uh, climate change is occurring a lot faster than we first thought experts say, or officials are now saying we'll hit two degrees Celsius uh, before, you know, so-and-so. I mean, it may not be as as near term as what we deal with on the social media side, but I mean, is there any any frustration on your end with that? Oh, hugely so. It's it's we've always <laughs> when I first started in this a long time ago, um, if I had a paper that appeared in a high profile journal, then there might be a news story, and then people would start sending me mimic graft papers of their theory of the world or why Einstein was wrong okay. or why the comet is going to roll the earth over the conspiracy or, and occasionally the, yeah, you, yeah. you need, you know, we used to get this. We've always had these sort of fringe persons. The internet allows them to find each other. And some of the algorithms on some of the social media seem to amplify them and route some people into these corners and other people into other corners. And it's, it's, it's really hard to get out of. And there's a huge, there's a whole lot of really good people who have really been misled because they've been fed stuff that just isn't so. And it's the same problem you have. Yeah. Hmm. They yeah, don't send I mean, mimeographs yeah, anymore. Though. We run into that. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even run know what a mimeograph that. is. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I know what you mean. I mean, um, but um, we we call them armchair yeah. meteorologists or meteorologists <laughs> and things like that. Yeah, you know, yeah, and it does get out there, and and a lot of times we got to reel that in with our clients because our clients get well, word, that's, yeah. uh, who get our forecast, and then they're saying like, well, what's going on? I'm hearing about two feet, and then we have to reel them in and say like, okay, yes, one of the model runs might have had that, but the next one had nothing. So, <laughs> you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt, and you know, it's un it's unfortunate, but at least it gives us a chance to explain why that's probably unlikely. Um, you know, based on everything we're looking at. Right. Um, and but... I, I will chime in for just a moment. I actually wrote a piece with a couple other folks that was published in Science a couple of years ago that sort of reviewed just how rapidly forecast skill has improved for weather and how many lives you save and how much money you save. The, the weather forecasting uh, enterprise broadly. 
And, um, and it's just amazing in, in my lifetime, what has been learned, what has been done and how much better it is. And it was the, the, the days when the hurricane was going to get you before you could get out of the way were real. That's when I grew up and that's not true anymore. And it's, so it's, it's really wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it's amazing. And, and that's where I, you know, sometimes we get a little bit irked when people would, you know, may come up to you and say like, you know, we were better back in the seventies or the eighties. And I'm like, well, no, no. not really. <laughs> um, not at all. Uh, no, um, no, so, no, no, no. It's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's always, you know, problems with that going on. Um, um, we talked about though, a little bit about, um, um, you know, Earth's long history, extinctions, migrations, um, you know, climate changes that might have affected extinctions or migrations. Um, now, in the past, in, in your class, you talked a lot about abrupt climate change. So I'm curious, like, what are we talking about when you say abrupt? I mean, are we talking, how many years are we talking here that things could change rather dramatically? Right. So the the really so clearly if a meteorite hits you and it, it makes it dark, that was really abrupt, but that's very, <laughs> sure. very rare. The biggest picture is usually a lot slower than that. It's CO2 goes up and it gets warmer, CO2 goes down and it gets colder. Um, but these abrupt climate changes that that I got to work on a lot um could have been the fastest ones may have been a change in a in a summer for example, uh, in the next winter. It, so it could have been down to one year. And it's a change in circulation that had globally averaged almost no effect, but a real rearrangement of the circulation. The Atlantic Ocean is a little bit saltier than the Pacific because water that evaporates from the Atlantic, from the Caribbean, blows across Central America and rains on the Pacific. And it leaves salt behind uh, because Central America isn't really high, but it blocks the ocean. And so now what happens? You're leaving salt behind. How does that salt get with the rain in the Pacific? And the answer is it goes north to Norway. It sinks in the winter. It goes south of the deep Atlantic. It goes around Antarctica. It goes north in the deep Pacific, and it mixes up to the surface in a thousand years. And it's just because you have a low Central America that blocks the ocean and not the atmosphere that you have this salt freshwater problem. And that's, oh dear, what a Rube Goldberg device that the water hops over in a week and the salt gets to it in a thousand years. And during going into and out of the ice age, there were times that this system broke for a while. If you take a big lake that the glacier is dammed and you dump it into the North Atlantic, then the fresh water on the surface makes a puddle, it freezes in the winter, and it's cold. That's the Younger Dryas. And then after a while, the, the gyre, the, the subtropics get really salty in the Atlantic and it turns back on again. And it can just go, and it's like, like, the drain opening after your drain has been plugged that all of a sudden you flush that out of the way and the currents keep get going back to the North Atlantic. And so it's possible to change that. Does the surface of the North Atlantic freeze or does it sink um, with a little bit of fresh water? And you know the difference between open ocean in the dark Arctic and sea ice in the dark Arctic is like, well, it can be 40 degrees. It's huge. And so there's these sudden changes that happen at certain very special times during the ice, going into and out of the ice ages. So I guess that's where the, the impact hypotheses are so, um, I don't know what other word to say for it, but so interesting for people or, or they grab onto it, they latch onto it because they can say, okay, you know, this impact happened. It melted the ice sheet quickly. A lot of fresh water went into the ocean. And that's why we had this climate change so quickly. 
That's that that was why it was such a, a an intriguing possibility that just doesn't work. And like I say, the biggest thing is once we finally got good records, and I played a very small role in one of the studies that made the first really good records. And you realize that this was just sort of an oscillation that got going, sort of a fifteen hundred year oscillation that um if you if you flush a whole bunch of salt out of the Atlantic, then it's getting fresher and then it can freeze and then you build up the salt in the Atlantic and then it starts over again and you just got sort of something that was doing like this. Um, it's really hard. It was easy to do that during the Ice Age because you drop the world's biggest, most boring ski area on Canada. Right, you 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 cover Canada with this gigantic ice sheet that is two miles thick and a continent wide, and what does that do? The normal pattern, you, you do this, right? The wind goes up over the Rockies, it goes down to Texas, and then it cranks up over you, where you're sitting, and it heads up for Norway. But if there's this gigantic ice sheet in the way, that straightens that out. It doesn't go up to the far north. And then it's pretty easy to puddle some fresh water up there and freeze it. And so when there's an ice sheet, it's easier to make changes in the North Atlantic where the sinking happens. Once you get that ice sheet out of the way, the winds go up there and you try to dump fresh water up there and it just, the, the winds move it away. And so this was easy when there was an ice sheet on Canada. So nowadays, you know, you know, we're hearing a lot about the the warming that's occurring and the ice sheets are are are, are melting you know to an extent that's uh, pretty low compared to historical standards so is, is any of this melting occurring enough fresh water to cause an issue or not we're, we're there's a little interest right so the north atlantic is freshening and that probably is slowing things down um there are there is some concern that over a hundred years or so we could could really slow it down. We don't think it would drop off suddenly. If it slows down, probably it will do so at a slow enough rate that it won't offset the CO2 warming for anyone anywhere. Right now, you know, there's a little place south of Greenland and Iceland that isn't warming, even though everything around it is. Um, and but it would be a big thing for regional weather if it happened. It would be a big thing for fisheries and, and issues such as that. You're used to finding the things that you fish for here, and now the ocean has changed, so you don't. So it's one of those issues for sort of long, long weather, short climate forecasting that that could get interesting. But we don't think that's a big issue. The, the much bigger issue is is what the melting of the ice will do to sea level, really. Yeah, I was I was just going to say the and uh, in the, in the currents, I guess, uh, in the airflow, I mean, how much is that going to be disrupted here over the next 100 years? I think that's that's more on the table of a meteorologist. You know, wh where, what does the Gulf Stream do? Because that's a driving factor for weather, especially here on the East Coast, whether it's winter or summer. And that, of course, has a impact on hurricane season and you know what about the strength of hurricanes i mean you know all this uh, i don't know what to believe as a, even as a meteorologist it has her have hurricanes become stronger or, or you know have severe weather events become more uh i guess extreme or is it because we have so much observation these days uh you know maybe 200 years ago there was an ef4 tornado in the middle of nebraska that nobody saw it was never documented because nobody saw it now you can have a, you know, you can have a quick spin up that lasts five seconds uh, and someone catches it and it's recorded as a tornado. So, you know, I, I'm kind of on that on that side of things. You know, I'm not doubting there's climate change, but I'm just a little more on the I think we have a lot more observation now versus even just 50 years ago. We surely do. And tornadoes in particular, you know, the weaker ones that it's this is almost certainly improved observational systems that are doing it. What happens to numbers of tornadoes going forward is, is I think, still open. Almost guaranteed that they're going to change their 
statistics, right? Where they are when they're most intense, because you don't just warm everything. You are right. Doing- and, and not to interrupt, you know, the, the other thing is the hurricane season too. That's kind of been the big question on the table now for Atlantic hurricane season. You know, it's been a hot topic really for the last few years. I mean, do we move it now to May 15th? as the start of the hurricane season, or do we leave it at June 1st? And I mean, I'm okay with ma- moving to, is, there's always something that happens in even April and May in the Atlantic. You always have that first or second named storm before you even get to June 1st. Right. And, and hurricanes. And so, so a piece of the hurricane story is really easy. Global warming has made them rainier when they go because the warmer air is holds more, more moisture. Water, sure. And so the, yeah, so th- that one is easy. Just, just shut up. Yes, it's happening. That's real. Um, the, after that, you know, it gets, you know, the story, right? So, so if you wanted to have a, a fire or something, you need fuel, you need a match and you need good, it, you can't have a sprinkler breaking it off to have a hurricane. You need fuel is hot water. Uh, you need a match is something like a, a convective system coming off of Africa and you need, you can't have really strong wind shear, you know, because you can't blow the top off. And we're getting more fuel. It's getting warmer. The warm water is spreading. The warm water is is coming earlier. It's lasting later. So there's more fuel. There's more energy to drive the biggest ones. But what happens to convective systems coming off of Africa is way harder. What happens to wind shear is way harder to do. That's all, you know, and some of that's going to depend on what the Pacific is sloshing back in El Nino and La Nina and for, for, especially for typhoons over there. The, the best thing would be that the, you can get fast intensification, you can get bigger storms, but you might actually end up with fewer. That's still open. But but there's more fuel to make the bigger ones a little stronger. There's there's more chance of rapid intensification. And very clearly, warmer air can dump more rain. So the, the rain, if, if you're worried about on-land flooding from rainstorms, that's getting worse. Well, last year, I mean, it was, it was a great example of a uh, um, storm. What was it? What was it? I'm not the, uh, what was the one, Mike? Um, devastated New Jersey. I can't remember the name of it now. Ida, Ida? yeah, the, the Ida storm, and and it was, and I actually saw a stat which I I knew last year, but I just didn't fathom it again until I saw it just a couple of weeks ago that more people died in New Jersey due to flooding versus actual landfalling of the storm down in the Gulf Coast, and that was what a Category Four, I think. Yeah, flooding's flooding's getting to be a big deal, and it is. You know, we've it, and this comes back to your point that we've sort of built for the world we have, and <clears throat> a little bit of extra rain can make a lot of extra flood, and that's the you know because the the world is used to running off what it gets, and then the flood is a little extra on top, and we're seeing very clear increases in the intensity of the most intense rains across most of the United States, uh, if not all of the United States, including certainly us in Pennsylvania and New, you in New Jersey. Hmm. So um, I'm just curious, we talked a little bit about the hurricanes in the tropics and possibly producing more rain. Would that be, would there be any type of like positive feedback mechanism that could happen there where you get more rain, it adds more fresh water, and then it slows down the circulation, then you get even more rain, and then you kind of keep that mechanism going, and then all of a sudden, you got a big problem going on? Probably not. um, You know, it's, these are the sorts of questions that our community looks at, and we're really excited to study. Um, That one, probably not. Um, It's fine, you know, the ultimately, the climate has a lot of diffusion, a lot of smoothing in it. Um, weather systems will keep being weather systems and they'll do what they do. Um, it's so I'm, I'm guessing no, but, but it's a fascinating question. So. No, it was just something that came to my mind when I was thinking about that. <laughs> we were talking about all of those the heavier rains and, and, going well, and then on the, and then the flip um, side though, you can talk about even the, you know, the, 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 dearth of rain and precipitation in the west and how that just seems like 
you know, they'll get a trough out there. They'll get their rain for like a week. And then all of a sudden they're back to their, their drought setup. And, and it just seems like each year it's, it's a, it's a stronger ridge and, and it's a drier ridge and it just prevents rain out there. And, and you can see that just in the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the dams out there and, and just the, the lake beds that are so dry now. Yeah. I I've been given a, a talk on climate change for 30 plus years now. And I, for 30 plus years, I've had a str slide in it that said more floods and more droughts. So, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. The warmer air can hold more water. So when conditions are right, it can rain more intensely. Every, clothes dryer and hair dryer has a heating element for a really good reason. It dries off faster. And so you actually do end up with more floods and more droughts. Um, you get these big intense rainstorms and then it, it, probably fewer of the big ones. Um, and then you get shifts in these patterns and that, that change who's wet and who's dry. And so this is something we've been saying for decades and it's happening. Right. That kind of leads us into, um, there's some climate models out there that might try to simulate what may happen over the next hundred years or something like that. I think you had mentioned that. Now, are are they proving to be accurate? Are, are they a good estimation of what may happen? Um, is there any bias within within those models that, you know, can throw it one way or another. Yeah. So, so you probably know the big modeling groups have, they, they pretty much unified their weather and climate models. And they, you, you'd use one where you start it with a spin up from the current observations to do weather. And you may use it a little differently when you're, you're running it for climate and you do, but you do ensembles again and the same thing. It's the same physics. It's the same model going on. They work for the weather and they actually do work for the climate. What's happening now really is what they said when I was a student. Um, if there's a bias in the model, so we check them against the past and we find that they work for that too. If there's a bias, there's a little more warming from CO2 than the models give, not less. And I th this one's pretty clear that the, there's no, <clears throat> no way that these models are being alarmist. They're not making things look worse than they should, but maybe they're making it look a little better. And this probably part of this is linked to changes in ice sheets. It's, um, and part of it may be linked to most of the models are not including, um, it got warm, the ice in the permafrost is melting, that's letting the dead mammoths and the, the, the peat moss from 50,000 years ago rot and give off its CO2 and methane. Um, so, so the models work when we check them against the past, they're really good, or the world changes a little more over geologic time than the models would have. So we talked a lot about the CO2 and, you know, you talked about the levels of CO2 being really high. Now, some people might say, well, you know, being devil's advocate here, well, CO2 levels have risen in the past and, you know, this is what happened and that would happen. Have we ever reached a level of CO2 in the atmosphere that we are at now? Yeah. So we certainly have had warmer times in the past because of more CO2. We've also had times in the past that we humans would not have lived in the tropics if we hadn't invented air conditioning because it would be too hot for us to live there. So, um, so there is there is this that yeah, it's um, to reasonable approximation, CO two is the most important control on the history of Earth's climate. And it's, and we spent, you know, a whole semester doing that. I'm in the middle of spending a whole semester doing that again. There's a lot that underlies that. Climate depends on all sorts of things and features of Earth's orbit that change over tens of thousands of years. And, you know, if you, if you had no continents near the equator, uh, the ocean is a little darker than the land is. That affects the temperature. If you take a continent and you drift it from the equator to the pole, it's going to get colder and it's also going to affect the globe a little. But overall, CO2 has been the biggest control. When CO2 has changed, uh, life has changed. 
um, because the climate changed. Um, it's a it's a fascinating thing, you know. Um, I have met the people. I've met the senator who looked me in the eye and said, climate has always changed, so we should not worry about humans changing the climate. <laughs> now, you know, you forecast fire weather as well, and you do forecasts for fires, but you're worried about where fires have burned. And if you know that fires have burned in a place, then you're going to tell people when it's getting into the conditions that would cause a fire. Fires have always happened, so we worry about arson. People have always died, so we worry about murder. Climate has always changed, which means it's probably a good idea to understand climate change and human causes. And so this argument, climate has always changed, is a very strong reason to learn about this. Yeah, I guess the, the hardest thing to, to get over is like you're, we're watching it happen before our eyes versus where people are, ah, nothing's really changed. But, you know, in, in, in our you know, field, of course, you know, we see the differences from weather from day to day. But, you know, granted, you know, I'm, I'm getting up there and I'm in my forties, but you know, I, I can even remember back, you know, when I was a teenager, how different the weather's <laughs> changed in just the last like 30 years. I mean, it's like, I, I definitely can, I definitely noticed something in just in this, in this short amount of time I've been on earth and I couldn't even imagine, you know, 50 years from now, what it could be like. Well, we'll, we'll decide. I mean, 50 years from now, you guarantee that the weather forecasters are still going to be important. So because weather, we still live in weather and, you know, so much of the day to day is the weather is not the climate, but the baseline is changing and the sort of what you're going to advise people about. Um, eventually, people are going to decide, are we living near the coast? Are we living near the stream? How far away from the river do we need to be to be safe? And um, what the flood forecasts are going to be are going to depend on the climate as well as the weather. So you'll be retired and enjoying a well-earned, <laughs> yeah. well-earned senior itis. But but the forecasters who follow you are are going to have different norms because of climate. And how different is decisions that we're making now? Well, the good thing is, is I don't have to worry about streams or rivers because I live on top of a hill. So I'm in good shape. <laughs> there you go. but, there. but I guarantee Personally. you, you have listeners who are not on top of the hill. <laughs> exactly. And I'm sure they are very concerned. Uh, and the truth is, that. we're almost on the top of the hill. But <clears throat> when we had the thunderstorm on top of the big snowpack back in... 96, I think it was. We had a lot of water in the basement. <laughs> I remember that storm, yeah. <laughs> that, that That is true. Um, one last thing I, I really wanted to just kind of touch on is um, I, was, I was always very intrigued on how volcanoes and can really affect the climate. Like stuff like you mentioned Pinatubo and stuff like, you know, Krakatoa um, that, that occurred and and Tambora and those big, you know, eruptions can really affect climate. Uh, just like how how much can that affect things, and how quickly can that affect? Mount Saint Helens, yeah. Too. So so volcanoes are just so. Oh, first thing, volcanoes um, on human times, no big volcano ever is big enough to matter to CO two to the greenhouse effect. Um, the, the total flux from all volcanoes on Earth is about 1% of the flux from, from human burning of fossil fuels. So it's this bizarre thing. If you turned up volcanoes, let's make them go faster. In a million years, it's going to be warmer because of the CO2. Because it, they, they would build it up over a long time. But over the next decade or two or three, it's going to be colder because they don't put out enough CO2 to matter over a year or 10 or 20 or 30, but they do put out particles that block the sun and make it colder. 
And if you look at an ice core record, you look at tree ring records, lake sediments, the big volcanic eruption the next year is cold. And it's you a big one is a fraction of a degree, a degree F, something like that. Um, it's interesting because there's patterns to it because blocking the sun doesn't make it really cold if you're in the Arctic winter because there's no sun to block, but it does make it cold in the tropical summer because there's a lot of sun to block. So there's a there's some shifting in the patterns. Um, sometimes plants get really grumpy because they had a late frost. Sometimes plants get a little happy because there's diffuse light and they're not getting zapped by what would give us a sunburn. Um, and so there's a lot of things that show up in, in biology. There's things that show up in, in rain patterns and circulation patterns and so on. The so-called Little Ice Age, which was mostly a cold time in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s in Northwest Europe, has some volcanic imprint to it, a bunch of volcanoes blocking the sun. Um, and you can find pieces of human history that have the volcano blocked the sun, caused the late frost, hurt the crop, uh, the people were already close to starving, and then things cascade out of the changes. So if, if you don't have the ability to buy food from somebody else and you're living on whatever you can grow and you're poor and you don't have transportation and then your crop freezes, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds terrible. Um, is is that was there a, a volcanic volcanic impact with these to the uh, they called it the year without a summer yep. in the eighteen hundreds something like that was that a volcanic that's impact a volcanic also? impact yes okay yeah um, I, I was just curious about that one you know you know all the time you hear about you know doomsday people talking about you know the Yellowstone caldera erupting and. You know that that's ready to erupt any time now, but really, it's not. Really, it's, it's like, not. No, I, 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 have, I have checked that from time to time to uh, look at the Yellowstone uh, page. They have the, all that monitoring going on on their web page, and uh, yeah, it's it's, 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 it's it would have probably been a lot of eruption spread out. I was in Yellowstone, and and I'm talking to a ranger, and we're having a good chat, and somebody comes up and says, "The volcano is it going to?" get me and the ranger says well i'm here if you see me running then you go ahead and go <laughs> <laughs> so no it's it's volcanoes are noise right so they affect climate but there's no way for a volcano in alaska to call up a volcano in indonesia or a volcano in iceland and say let's erupt on three mm. So they're just noise. <laughs> when the next one happens, the following year will be cooler than otherwise because it's blocking the sun and we'll have to deal with that. And you guys will put it into your models and you'll tell people what it means. Um, but they're not doing much to the, the climate uh, because they're just random. They just it's like rolling dice or playing cards or something. Do, do we know of any impacts yet from the, this re most recent one? That was Tambora, right? Over, what, about two months ago? So, so the recent one probably didn't put up enough stuff to match. I know it was pretty high, Lovely. yeah. If, yeah, yeah. If, if you were right next door in the ash fall and you're filling your crops, you were unhappy. If you got hit by the tsunami, you were unhappy. But um, it didn't. The big thing is getting a lot of sulfur into the stratosphere. If it goes into the troposphere, if it's down here, the rain takes it out in two weeks, you know this, and so it doesn't do anything. If it gets in the stratosphere, it's up there for a year or two. And usually it's, it's sulfur gases that make sulfuric acid, that make little droplets, that make brighter, you know, they um, kick up the albedo of the planet a little bit. So I guess the billion dollar or probably trillion dollar question <laughs> is, is there anything, we know the planet's warming, we know there's a lot of CO2, is there anything that we can potentially do um, to at least mitigate it a little bit at this point? So so far and away, the, the biggest thing is that right now, 
the cheapest electricity, the cheapest power to add to the grid is from renewables. And the International Energy Agency has said that, that we are now getting the cheapest electricity in human history from this. And there's a whole bunch of things. I, I have a long spiel that I, I do if people ask me that we, we do have good scholarship that if we use our knowledge on climate and energy, and we use it well, we use it with respect, we use it with recognition of just how valuable fossil fuels have been to us and that we're still using some of them. But if we make wise decisions, we get a bigger economy, right? So a colleague, Bill Nordhaus, won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2018 for work that allows decision-making on these big questions. And economically, we are hurting ourselves by not dealing with this efficiently. We get a bigger economy, we get more jobs, we get a cleaner environment, we, we're more ethical, we're healthier, um, and we have greater national security. And our military leaders have been clear, if you're starting to make it too hot for people to live in certain places and they become refugees, that's all bad for them, but it also causes all sorts of disruptions for national security. Um, you will find a lot of pundits. You can pick up any, just about any big newspaper and find people pointing out that, that there is a link between our energy system and a war that's going on right now. And so there's a whole bunch of things that are out there. So, so the big thing is because it has now gotten so cheap to generate energy in a renewable way, we can start seriously thinking about moving towards a, a sustainable energy system. Um, it's, it's amazing what can be done. But then politics get in the middle of it years. and get, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a never ending. It just, it just annoys me to the point where, you know, our, our world leaders cannot see eye to eye on all this stuff. And we have so much debate still about, you know, which direction to go in. And, you know, it's, it's always going to be politics and we know what we need to do, but it just won't get done. And we, you know that as well as I well, do. Well, maybe it will, you know, I at hope the so. point where, at the point where people have wrapped around the political spectrum and they yeah. say, I want to buy the new electric pickup truck put a solar cell and a pickup truck on my house, I can now take care of myself um, if the hurricane knocks out the grid and I can flip the bird at the big company. At the point where you've got people on both ends of the political spectrum pushing for the same solutions, the world may change. And there will be, you know this, there are going to be weather persons who are forecasting the grid because getting the wind and the sun right and turning off the turbines when the migrating bats are coming through is going to be weather forecasts. Well, I, I, I really hope that we can come to that conclusion and, and just stop fighting each other <laughs> over, over things because, man... Uh, there's more important things, right, uh, that we can be doing. Um, but um, Dr. Alley, I, I really would like to thank you uh, for joining us today. Thank you very much, yeah, for joining us. Yeah, like I said, maybe maybe we can revisit in the fall or something before we get into the winter season because that, that's really our busy time. But yeah, maybe we can uh, record something else here in uh, October or something. I'm sure we could talk about uh, many more topics and. Uh, this might just be scraping the surface here, Dr. Alley, with what we can talk about. Um, but I really do appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Um, I mean, it, it was really a good time. Well, thank you, Mike. It's great to see you again. Mike and Brad, both of you, thank you. And do take care. All right. And thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, don't forget, we have a new podcast every two weeks here on the Weather Lounge. So please rate the podcast, too. That helps push our show forward and don't forget to visit weatherworks on social media and as always visit us at weatherworksinc.com that's all for this episode thanks for joining us